Welcome, everybody, to Rewind the Dynamite. It is John Pollock here alongside Wei Ting coming at you on this Wednesday night. Hello, Wei. Hey, John. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Uh, ready to chat about another busy day. Lots going on. And we have a Dynamite episode to get into tonight from Daly's Place once again. Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the shows continue on and uh, a new edition of NXT as well. Not a taped one, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, this was from... Well, it was taped, I guess. But It, it, was, it was taped, but was yeah, studio. still new content. Yeah, they were at Full Sail tonight, and it was Tom Phillips and Byron Saxton calling the show tonight. And yeah, next week they're going to start rolling out their takeover matches, including uh, two weeks from now, they're going to do Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's what's coming up on the NXT horizon. Uh, how are you doing? How's everything? How's life? Ah, about the same. Same as yesterday and the day before. That's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to mention off the top that on Thursday, I'm making my big return to the cafe hangout. I will be with Wei on Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And we're going to be dedicating a lot of time on that show to the debut episode of season two of Dark Side of the Ring, chatting about the Chris Benoit documentary. Uh, that way, have you gotten to see the whole thing by now? I have, yeah. I, I watched it on Crave last last night. So it did end up on Crave? Yes, it did at 10 o'clock. Okay, right. The whole two hours. Correct, yeah. I mean, the first hour was already up, and right. then uh, the second hour uh, appeared yesterday. Yep. Gotcha. So Wei and I are going to um, give our thoughts. I specifically want to talk to Wei and get uh, his view on the documentary. So that will be coming up on Thursday. And then we'll open up the phone lines. And I want to hear feedback from the listeners uh, for those that have gotten to see it. And we'll go through whatever other news is going on, chat a bit about NXT, uh, whatever else uh, is happening. So that's Thursday on the Cafe Hangout. I'm excited, Wei. And I encourage everybody, if you've seen it, to uh, check out John's great interview with Jeff Merrick. That's on the feed right now, uh, talking about Jeff Merrick's thoughts about the entire documentary, because he, uh, not just a, a former wrestling podcast host and a former uh, co-creator of The Law, but also somebody who was close friends with Chris Benoit at a time. So it was a really fascinating discussion with a lot of great insight. Yeah, I, I would say that Jeff was someone that knew Chris extremely well, and there were many stories in there that uh, I had never heard before, and uh, quite the line that he was given by Vince McMahon about being a carnivore that loves to devour steak, and hmm. man, I, I don't know, maybe that the influence of that interview has already been felt in the wrestling world tonight, I don't know. Very possibly, I wonder. Uh, so you can go check that out, that full interview. Uh, it's almost an hour. It's up at postwrestling.com. Uh, it was very kind of Jeff to to join me and uh, talk about what's obviously very uh, a difficult subject. So, uh, And he also saw the documentary, so providing his thoughts on the piece itself. Uh, what else do we have going on, Way? Lots of news uh, to get into. Uh, shall we move over there? Yeah, let's do it. Um, the first thing I wanted to note that um, – I was I was just getting like some of this information right towards the end of Dynamite, but uh, tonight's episode was actually a combination of live and taped content. Uh, I don't know how much was taped uh, ahead, but I would imagine at least next week's show that they've taped enough for next week. But I, I don't know exactly how much was taped, but uh, it sounds like they were there um, at Daly's place, likely Monday and Tuesday uh, filming stuff. Oh, interesting. Okay. And I mean, kind of that, that last segment with Matt Hardy's entrance, I mean, obviously uh, that had to have been taped. So um, anyway, that's uh, at least, I, I would imagine that at least next week's is covered if uh, perhaps more. Um, again, I was just getting some of these details uh, right at the end, but I, I was told from someone there that it was a combination of live and taped content tonight that they've been uh, hopefully just getting ahead of things because I think things are, 
You know, I, I think you should be taping as much as you can right now while you have the resources to and are able to get everybody to one central location. Yeah, at the rate things are moving, who knows when, you know, uh, Florida will institute a citywide shutdown and you can't even do a show like this. So, uh, and also really for the sake of everybody's travel to limit all that as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Orange County in Florida, they're actually instituting a stay at home policy that goes into effect Thursday night. Um, there are, like, as we've seen with some of these uh, restrictions, like there are exceptions for certain places. I don't know if WWE would be some kind of exception, but that does extend to Orlando where the performance center is. So um, they are planning to have their taping done by tomorrow night. Um, I checked in this morning. They were taping WrestleMania today and Thursday, and then hopefully that should be it for them to at least get through WrestleMania and the night after with Raw. So WrestleMania is going on right now. WrestleMania was being taped today, and it looks like they'll finish that up uh, tomorrow. And then so. WrestleMania will be done tomorrow. I mean, man, what a what a memorable WrestleMania. It's so Me- weird that WrestleMania is like a season of the Ultimate Fighter. Memorable certainly is the word. I mean, this will be talked about for many years to come. We'll always discuss the year WrestleMania. It's always going to be like 40 years from now. What WrestleMania drew the least amount of fans? And this is going to be that stupid person who's got the trick question, and it's this year's where... It, this this year drew zero fans. Yeah. Anyway, don't be that guy, um, everybody. Yeah, don't don't be that guy. Uh, we we get too many of those guys out there. Um, I am going to go over to uh, Andrew Thompson's uh, news update today from Post Wrestling. Did you did you read uh, Brie Bella's comments from today from oh, the I, podcast? I listened to the podcast. Actually. Oh, you listened to the podcast. Yeah. Okay, well, let's read this quote. Okay, this is uh, Brie Bella speaking about husband Brian Danielson. She said, my husband is still working and he's in Orlando right now. And granted, he's working. He has a job, but it makes me really nervous. My husband has an autoimmune disease. He also fought asthma really bad when he was young. He was always sick when he was a kid. And I'll admit, I lost sleep last night. Uh, She goes on to say that I'm really scared that he's just out there. I just pray so much for him that he stays healthy and all but it's like this weird tug of war. And she goes on to say that I feel bad because he's over there. And when he comes home, we're going to have him be put up in a hotel. And essentially, like he's going to have to quarantine himself just as a precaution. Uh, Bree, of course, is pregnant. And Nikki you know, as this, well. Nikki as well. Um, but yeah, these are, you know, the concerns. And you, you certainly look at that with, with Daniel Bryan and, you know, what other like the all i'm saying is that i I think that you know you and i've been very vocal about like the risk that is being incurred here and it's going to vary for some people and i would say with with daniel bryan you look at that and you know there's obvious concern and i'm sure for people like significant others that are going to be concerned about the person but also what they could possibly bring back it's like this is a this is a real significant thing that's out there oh certainly yeah i mean you know, uh, what I think uh, Bree's comments represented were, was just one sampling of, I'm sure, what every performer's family is going through right now. Having, you know, um, somebody get on a plane and travel to a, a place and wrestle, you know, in a climate like this um, with other people that are getting off of planes and also, you know, coming from uh, several parts of the world, going through airports. It is absolutely concerning. And, um, you know, the... It's, I guess it's, you know, because the Bellas have this podcast, you actually get to hear it. But let's not pretend that this this type of fear doesn't exist worldwide with anybody going uh, right now with family that's, you know, going to work, uh, people working at hospitals or people working in any sort of like at the grocery store. Uh, but certainly, you know, those are, are essential services. And again, you can engage in the debate about whether or not professional wrestling falls into that category. That might vary for some people. But um Certainly, um, you know, it, it's just a small glimpse about the reality of the situation. And, you know, I think I applaud them for taking the precaution because they, I guess, you know, not everybody even has the luxury to be able to quarantine and self-isolate for 14 no. days after that. And, you know, Brian and the Bellas do, and I applaud them for taking that precaution. But I imagine a lot of people won't have that luxury. Um, so staying kind of on that um, uh, re- regarding uh, WrestleMania. So... Dana Brooke was initially announced for the six-pack challenge. Uh, 
I did check in. She's definitely out of that match. Uh, now, Dave Meltzer has reported that she is in quarantine. And Dave also added that's the same uh, for Rey Mysterio. Um, I, I, I wasn't told the specific reason for uh, D- Dana Brooke, but uh, she did uh, post up this like home workout video on Instagram. And she did put quarantine as one of the hashtags in there. And I, I don't think anyone is confusing this, but obviously being in quarantine is different than necessarily having the virus. So that doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, yeah. But nonetheless, those two not expected to be part of WrestleMania. Yeah. And I believe um, uh, we mentioned before Graves and Carmella under self-isolation or quarantine. I mean, I, I imagine people confuse the terms and at this point they might as well kind of mean the same thing, but right. It just seems yeah. like people are, you know, taking uh, just, just staying back and not, not going to work. But um, have any of them shown any symptoms to your knowledge? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. No. All right. Um, but it does bring about, you know, once they're done, this marathon of tapings are like, what is the next step here? Is it post after this episode of Raw that airs April 6th? Are they expecting everyone back on fr- on that Friday for SmackDown or at least the SmackDown crew back for that? And are there going to be um, talent that are going to be quarantining themselves after all of these tapings? And just and that's going to be a 14 day period. It's a big question. Uh, I'm sure nobody knows right now. I don't even know if they would know. You know, I think th- their main focus is to get through this set of tapings, uh, edit the, all the shows, have they'll, they'll be set for the next several weeks. But then after that, who knows what the world is going to look like, especially in the U.S. So I, I think it's really one day at a time. Yeah, you can't plan too far ahead. And I mean, at least there is like tapings that are occurring. I think that if you are going to make the decision to go forward with this, I mean, get as much as you can taped because, yeah, as you said, next week could be completely different than than what we're talking about right now. Um, some ratings notes. Uh, we'll start off with Raw. Um, it uh, fell significantly this past week. They were down 14%. They did 2,006,000 viewers. So this was their lowest number this year. Um, it was the second lowest third hour in the history of Raw being three hours, going back to the summer of 2000. And 12, just um, pretty much in every demo, like huge drops um, from last week. Last week, you know, certainly the story of last week was that the Royal Rumble carried that number. And even having Steve Austin in the third hour, it did not keep that audience in the third hour. There's a big drop in hour number three. Um, At the same time, wait, on Friday, SmackDown had one of its best numbers on Fox, like their fifth highest since they were on Fox. Uh, Do you read a whole lot into this number just in terms of what do fans want out of um, this empty arena version of Raw? Is it more older content or is this a week where there wasn't a whole lot advertised in advance? Um, I I I don't really know what to read into this number, but certainly this was a show that had a lot less interest than the week prior, which was also in an empty arena. I personally have no idea. You know, I look at a show like what we saw on Monday and I look at a show like they presented on Friday and to me, they're exactly the same thing. The only difference was one was an hour longer. Um, would that have had any sort of significant impact and somebody want, choosing to watch one versus the other? Perhaps. Uh, but I, I, you know, it's like it's 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 such a volatile um, set of da- data that I just I really don't have much conclusion to draw from it. I mean, SmackDown, you did have the advertisement of Gronkowski and Bill Goldberg um, you did. You were at least promoting some things in advance, but I don't know if we're at a stage where you know the the argument was you know more people are they're they're seeking out any kind of entertainment right now, and that was a positive for WWE to continue here. And I mean, at least this week, it would seem like just the idea of running a show isn't going to hook a gigantic amount of people because. That first hour was very low to begin with. It tells me like there wasn't a ton of interest in the show from the very beginning either. So um, I don't know. I, I don't know how much you put into just one number. And again, like these ratings are more so I'm just looking at what what the mindset is of fans versus one week over the other. Not so much that these ratings are anything you can put uh, too much emphasis into. Mm-hmm. 
Dark Side of the Ring, on the other hand, uh, came out with uh, a fantastic number. Uh, their highest in the show's history, and by a significant uh, amount. Last year, their highest number in season one was 234,000 viewers on Viceland uh, with the episode on the Von Erics. Uh, the Benoit episode debuted to 320,000 viewers. So a huge number uh, per the standards of Vice TV. Um, that, I mean, this this has become the cornerstone of this network, this this. Dark Side of the Ring series, and obviously the Benoit show was going to have a lot of kind of morbid curiosity, I would say, and there was also a ton of promotion for it in the, I would say, week leading up to it. Certainly, yeah. I mean, you know, based on the subject matter itself, I think there there is going to be a great deal of interest, but I think putting the first hour out for free for most viewers, I thought that was a really good idea as well, um, and you know, it was like, I think coming off of the second, first season, everybody recognized that this was going to be a high quality show uh, about a topic that, uh, you know, obviously doesn't get that much coverage elsewhere. So um, yeah, does not surprise me. And episode two next week will be on new Jack. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to it. And the last note here, um, Davey boy, Smith, Jr. Lucas Steele and Joel Redmond. They are, they were the foreigners uh, that were part of the champion carnival. Um, that is still, Still tentatively set for to start next week, uh, but they are off of that tournament. So I know Davey Boy Smith Jr. was extremely uh, looking forward to that tournament, but it looks like um, the situation in the world is going to prevent them from going to Japan. Hmm. Or at least, per, per, um, I don't know what the ultimate call was, because uh, like 24 hours ago, Davey Boy Smith Jr. had posted like he's getting on his way to go to Japan and was... You know, something happened, obviously, and then All Japan made the announcement that they are out. So those are some of the news items. You can uh, catch up on everything over at postwrestling.com. And I, I just want to mention here as well, uh, I did uh, I did my John Pollock press tour over the last two days as well, Way. Uh, I did an interview up at wrestlingobserver.com with Josh Nason on his show, and I did uh, Ariel Hawani's show today as well, talking about... Uh, the decision for the WWE and AEW to move forward, uh, comparing it to uh, kind of Dana White and the UFC and their actions throughout all of this and uh, WrestleMania being taped. Uh, lots of the subjects that we have covered uh, speaking with both of them. So if you want, if somehow you listen to our shows and you're not tired of my voice, there's more of it out there this week. There could never be enough, John Pollock. I don't know. I think I'm certainly pushing the limit this week. Well, I think people could use more, and they could, of course, pick and choose. So, yeah, awesome. Great. So that's uh, Wrestling Observer. Uh, Re- uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, res- WrestlingObserver.com, and you can just uh, – uh, probably the easiest way is just go to uh, Ariel Hawani on Twitter. He's got a link to it uh, right to the show. Um, Ariel Hawani's MMA show on iTunes. Excellent. So, there you go. AEW Dynamite from Wednesday night at Daly's Place, and off the top – Tony Schiavone is out there with Cody and Kenny Omega at the commentary position. And they tell Tony he's always been part of the elite. And I guess we can uh, talk about just some of the changes off the top. Uh, Notably, no Jim Ross, no Excalibur, and no Taz, uh, which Tony Schiavone said they did not make the trip. uh, But they're all fine. And, you know, we, we definitely saw adjustments from last week. There was no no wrestlers at ringside this week. And... You could see, like, they, uh, I, I think, took some of the criticisms of last week's show and, and made adjustments this week. That was noticeable to me, you know, and I, again, I applaud. If if that is the case, I mean, I certainly applaud them for listening to some of those criticisms and uh, erring more on the side of caution. Everybody loved last week's Dynamite, and I, I enjoyed it too. But one of the big problems I had was that I didn't really get a sense that they were taking enough precautions in the production of the show. Having people gathered around ringside... Um, maybe just a lot of the kind of unnecessary, you know, physical contact at a time when I think everybody was incredibly sensitive about it. I kind of felt like they weren't even taking as many precautions as I saw in WWE productions. So seeing all the changes they made a week later, to me, I think mm, was was a good indication that they are aware that perhaps, you know, Tully Blanchard doesn't need to be there. Uh, Arn Anderson doesn't need to be there. Jake the St. Roberts can film a vignette from home and have just as much effect. You know, um, I was happy to see a lot of the changes because even though I, I would definitely say it made for a, a lesser quality of show, um, I think there other precautions I think are just more important right now. Yeah. Um, 
I'm probably going to get all my my qualms with this out of the way because it was really just in the first match that there was a little bit of stuff. Um, but but certainly a marked improvement from last week. So they tee up the show. Cody says uh, when they mention Kenny, uh, Kenny Omega defending the AAA Mega Heavyweight title against Sammy Guevara that there is a receipt coming for Guevara because he popped Kenny's eardrum last week. And then we did kind of this awkward transition because Cody's in the booth and then he's got to go to his entrance because he's in the first match against Jimmy Havoc. So he comes out and before he leaves, he looks to Kenny and he looks to Shivani and they do the elbow tap. I was like, well, it's it's nice to know like they're being very um, conscious of, you know, the the issues at large. So they bump elbows. Cody makes his way to the ring. Handshake to Aubrey Edwards right away. Yeah. I was it's like, <laughs> if it, it, uh, it wouldn't even strike me so much other than they just did the elbow tap like 30 seconds before this, acknowledging that this is a handshake free world at the moment. I'm sure it's kind of tough to maintain uh, throughout, throughout the day, especially in the wrestling business when everybody's expected to, to shake hands so often. But, um, I I I I also imagine if you agree to participate in a pro wrestling match, you are kind of like agreeing to a level of risk, and that not just includes the participants in ring, but also the referee itself. I I did think like there were other instances tonight where I thought they were taking uh, great caution. So um, mm-hmm. pretty much like the only things that I, I really kind of saw is like kind of just were a little off putting. We're really in this one match. So um, let's can- also let's also make mention, of course, um, the cancellation of blood and guts, which they didn't necessarily announce, but that's that's fine. They announced it online, but not in the body of the show. To my no, knowledge. you're right. They didn't uh, they didn't mention that tonight. So and also um, the uh, lumberjack match or the parking lot brawl. Yeah, all those none things. of that took place, mm-hmm. or at least not tonight. So Kenny is on commentary with Tony Schiavone. And mentions how this is a good spirited show to lift up everyone's spirits. And here's Jimmy Havoc using closed fists. And he clearly needs the win more than Cody does. Uh, Cody did hit a Cody cutter and a figure four as Jimmy Havoc pulls at Cody's earlobe to try and break free. Then they fight on the floor and they make their way up to the broadcast area where Jimmy Havoc takes someone's previously used headset and puts it on. And then grabs Cody by the tongue, and then with his hands takes this headset off and places it back. Right. Yeah. That would that would be the end of my annoyances here, but completely unnecessary here. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree. Cody goes to the back and then runs back with a lariat, sending Jimmy Havoc into the ring. Uh, Cody fights back. Weight belt gets tossed over to Brandy and then goes for another Cody cutter and Havoc catches him with an arm bar. And then Havoc is manipulating the wrist, which Kenny Omega says shades of Konami in stardom. Yes. Yes. Who, what, a, what a shout out. I guarantee you this guy watched the Cinderella tournament on Tuesday. I, I'm sure he did. Cody ends up getting out, hits two crossroads and wins the match in 10 minutes and 41 seconds. Uh, something to also mention was that instead of having people ringside, they would constantly cut to the back, and it looked like some sort of like room or trailer just full of, uh, I guess, members of the roster that were present, and they were kind of doing the, the same betting thing. You had Sean Spears back there, Austin Gunn was back there with Billy Gunn, and they were kind of trying to fulfill some of that same ambience that they provided last week, except this time from a backstage setting. And, you know, it wasn't really all that lively for the most part. The first few times they cut there... It wasn't until Chris Jericho stepped in and really it was almost like, you know, he was watching this and he was like, man, do I have to do everything around here? So he popped in the back and like his energy definitely added something to fill the silence that ended up, um, you know, uh, kind of dominating this match, I would say. Um, I thought the match was fine. Not necessarily anything that eye catching. Again, I think, you know, we're talking about a period now where it feels like matches are being out there are, are being put out there. Um, just to kind of fill content time. Um, and everybody, of course, tries their best. But mm, yeah, it was it was a fine match. Yeah, it was it was all right. Um, you know, they yeah, not 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 great, not not bad. It was just uh, you mm-hmm. know, I, I, I was satisfied. It with was it. a new match for people that are in in dire need of new wrestling content. Yeah. Um. In terms of the locker room cutaways, you know, I I thought that okay, 
they have acknowledged like having them ringside is not the wisest idea. So we're going to do this. We still want to have that ambience. I thought it was like a good idea. I just thought it kind of wore thin by the end of the show. Yeah. I, th- yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought, I thought it was really good when Jericho was, was, was there. Um, by the time you kind of got to the end of the show, when it was like Austin Gunn and Dasha, it kind of felt like those, uh, you remember like when they did the draft on Fox and USA and they would cut to the back to see the reaction of the, you know, quote unquote network executives. It kind of felt like that oh, staged yeah. and that canned, but you know, again, they're, they're trying, you know, they're trying to, to provide some ambience. Then they had a taped video with Jake Roberts in front of a fire. He said that Lance Archer is chomping at the bit to get in the ring and somebody from AEW he wants to get his hands on. Jake is the best mind in wrestling history, and when AEW launched, he did not receive a call. So he tells Cody to bring the old man, Arn, and whatever her name is, sit down and give us something to sign so that Cody can meet us just once. And they did this extreme close-up into his eyes, and we go back to the ring with Cody, who is still in the ring from his win, reacting after watching Jake. I was really happy to see this. You know, the fact that they, rather than had Jake Roberts come all the way out here from wherever he lives, they probably took a camera to him or hopefully took him to a place that, you know, wasn't as far and recorded this. And I thought they achieved more with Jake this week via remotely produced video than they did last week with him sitting ringside and what? Watching Cody's match with Lance Archer? Like, what did he do last week? What? Why was he needed there? Yeah, um... It's a great question. I mean, he was just there last week, and it was um, just to be there. Yeah, uh, same same goes for Tully. You know, all these guys who definitely don't need to be traveling. And, I mean, that goes for anybody on the roster who doesn't necessarily have a, a match or a major role uh, in, in this episode or another set of tapings. Shoot your stuff from home or somewhere else. Send a camera guy. Yeah, you can, you can do that option. And um, certainly... You know, that, that, that can work. Absolutely. So, you know, it's, if you're doing these shows, it's, it's a learning process. And I look at, you know, last week, it's not like they just said, Hey, this is the way we're doing things. It was okay. What worked? What didn't work? And I I saw like a much improved uh, focus on that this week. So, um, and I really like, um, are you afraid of the dark Jake Roberts? Wow. Hosting in front of the fire. Mm Mm-hmm. Canadian fans might get that reference. That show was on the U.S. too. Was it? Okay. Pretty sure it was, yeah. Cody returns to commentary. Uh, It's Tony that engages with the handshake after the match. And notes that he is 6-2 and this year. And Cody mentions how his left elbow is bothering him. And calls Jake bitter and jaded and everything he doesn't like about wrestling. And says that Archer in Japan... Uh, He saw him in Japan, but he has no body of work in AEW. And I don't want to be a whiny baby face and says that Lance can debut on the next Dynamite. Mm -hmm. He said next week first, and then he said next Dynamite. On next Dynamite, yes. So, um, yeah, I have no reason to believe there wouldn't be um, a Dynamite next week because they uh, were taping stuff. And I understand they may still be taping stuff as we speak. Okay, interesting. So, anyway, it looks like they will have uh, plenty uh, in the can coming out of uh, Jacksonville. So, anyway, um, this sets up Lance Archer's debut to probably just kill somebody. And I guess Cody and Lance Archer as sort of a, uh, like an in-between program. Like, War Games or or Blood and Guts is on hold. This is uh, probably too far out to, I mean, double or nothing. Who knows what's even happening with that show. But uh, Cody and Archer seems to be something... You know, you build up to a TV at some point. Yes. I mean, that that is, I think, the plan. But who knows? Plans will change really quickly these days. Uh, there was a cool video with Darby Allen addressing Kip Sabian. He doesn't see anything super bad about him. They're just words. He's got these inner circle uh, cutouts that he had before and is wearing their faces with the eyes cut out. And Darby has known some super bad people. Sabian is a sacrifice for the sins of the inner circle and then puts all the uh, the cutouts onto a table 
douses it in gasoline and lights the table on fire. You know, last week they shot the um, Lance Archer video at Darby Allen's uh, property. Yeah. Yeah, that was really cool. So I guess that's what what Jake and, and uh, Lance Archer were, were there for. Um, well, where, where does Darby live? Darby lives in, um, I can't remember where Darby lives when Damien did the uh, location shoot with him. Where, where does Darby live? Um, we should ask Damien. Is it not in Georgia? Um, I'm not sure. Anyway. Okay. We'll find out before the end of the show. It's just, uh, escaping me right now, but everyone tweet us. Everyone let us know because we'll never find out if you don't. (laughs) Um, anyway, I liked the video. It was cool. It's really cool. And, you know, I, I think because AEW has sort of set a precedent of allowing so many of their talents to go out and film their own vignettes with, you know, their own friends, uh, that type of freedom, I think, will really help them out in these weeks when production is going to be so limited. Yeah. Um, moving on, we go to uh, highlights of uh, – oh, first we have the match here. Kip Sabian out with Penelope Ford taking on Darby Allen and – uh, this was where we just got Shivani with Cody. And how did you feel about Cody on commentary for the bulk of the show? I liked him. Um, I liked both he and Kenny. And I think, you know, Kenny seems to be more of the type to maybe focus on, like, the moves. But, you know, both of them, I think, were good candidates because I think they're both very well-spoken. Cody, I found more uh, somebody who was there to... Um, convey character and story. And I thought for the most part, especially for somebody who doesn't do this regularly, both of them, I thought did a good job. I thought so too. I, my rule with like new commentators is like the first, like 15, 20 minutes. Do not judge them on that. You'll either love them and it's probably too high of a praise or you'll hate them and it's too harsh. And I think that you have to give an assessment after the show. And I thought by, like Cody really to me got like the rhythm down and you know he was mixing in a lot of old references which I, I think probably works with with this audience but and he Tony, added like for Tony especially and for Tony as well yeah you know he was going to latch onto those and I really liked a lot of the details of like Cody's analysis throughout the matches and I thought for a guy that's probably done very minimal commentary in his career ever um I I, I thought he did a really good job here. Let's also remember that these guys are probably on the headsets every single week anyway, listening to the, to the commentary and maybe even in some cases feeding things to say. So um, I, I definitely felt like they were the right choice. I mean, these are guys that are going to have to be at these shows anyway. So, yeah. So uh, Penelope Ford ends up uh, – <laughs> first Cody compares Darby Allen to Sting and mentions the connection to the younger audience and then <laughs> – this just sounded funny given the the such the situation. He said, "You can see all the fans in the audience that are dressed like him with the paint." Hmm. Ford then pulls Sabian out of the way as Darby crashes through a guardrail, and we go through a break. Uh, we had uh, a comparison of Baby Doll to Penelope Ford, and Ford then shoves Kip Sabian away on the floor. Allen comes back with a low pay, and they clear the protective padding on the floor to hit the floor, allowing Cody to mention Bill Watts when they had gotten rid of the protective mats for a period. Uh, Mm -hmm. He emphasizes at one point when Kip doesn't put enough weight onto the chest of Darby Allen as he's going for a pinfall, and then it's Darby making his comeback, ties up the legs with a Gibson leg lock, a.k.a. the Last Supper that Tony identifies, and Darby Allen is victorious. Good athletic performance from both guys. Um, this time, I, I found it interesting they didn't bother cutting to the back for any sort of like ambience or, or commentary, but I, I enjoyed Cody on commentary. I thought Tony, you know, for again, for somebody who's not a play-by-play guy every single week, I found it very nostalgic to hear him do play-by-play again, and I actually enjoyed it for that reason. Um, he didn't really kind of sound too out of his element you know um when it was time like he seemed to like know enough moves to be able to call the moves he acknowledged that he didn't know as many as Excalibur but I thought he did a perfectly fine job um but you know these matches they're they're you know I think it's great that they're happening uh you know because a lot of people seem to need it but it's really tough to get emotionally attached to any of the matches I have to say especially this week I think with with the lack of you know um 
sound, but that that's just kind of what we're dealing with. Then they showed a highlight package of Jake Hager, and he did the squash match hey, with uh b- before that there there was a PSA for Las Vegas, which I don't know if it was like a Toronto or a TSN only thing, but I I wonder if like Americans saw it too. But you know, it just reminded me about double or nothing. Oh, I missed that. I, I didn't see it. What was it? Just uh in general? Like a lot of companies now are doing sort of like you know, I mean, everybody's getting junk mail of like company, every single company talking about how they're going to handle the COVID-19 crisis. And now that's permeated to television as well. And this one was uh, kind of Las Vegas's version where you had like a big drone shot of like pretty much the empty Las Vegas strip. And the tagline was pretty much like, we know it's really difficult to travel now. When you're ready, we'll be ready. Okay. Well, that's uh words of encouragement from Las Vegas. Glad to know they're they're thinking about everybody. Man, I think the goal is for them, for you to think about them as well. Well, in time, yes. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how how high a uh, trip to Vegas is going to be on people's priority list in the in the coming months, but maybe exercise some patience, Las Vegas. Mm, sure. Yeah. Jake Hager took on uh, Florida wrestler Chico Adams. This featured a Vader bomb, Uranagi, and an arm triangle to win this one in a minute six. And it was really just to set up the post-match, which was John Moxley walking out with the AEW championship to nail Hager with a paradigm shift after they exchanged blows. And then Hager re- responded by going for the ankle lock. So the, the idea here is that the paradigm shift did not keep Jake Hager down. Moxley escaped the ankle lock and then Hager took a powder, leaving uh, to the back as Moxley was left in the ring. Seemed to have no effect on Jake Hager, this no. paradigm shift. So, yeah, I mean, next program, and presumably you would think one of the matches that they might have taped? Possibly, yeah. They they certainly set this up because uh, after the break, Moxley did a promo. He said that Hager uh, needs to check his blind spot and... Moxley is now cleared. He's out for blood, and Hager walked away tonight, but it's going to come to a head when the title is on the line and said Hager will not be able to walk away because he will be carted out on a stretcher or John will die trying. Okay, so they were saving it for a title match. Yeah, so whenever they have this, it sounds like it will be John Moxley's first title defense with Hager. Uh, they also, um, on TSN here, got in a uh, Dark Side of the Ring promo, which, I mean, makes sense, obviously, with the connection with Crave. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it makes sense to utilize this show to promote that series. Then we had a recap of Brody Lee's reveal as the Exalted One last week, and then we got our taped hmm. segment with Brody Lee at the head of the table with his minions, Alex Reynolds and John Silver. And there is... Brody Lee just obsessively cutting his bloody, juicy steak. And he won't allow Reynolds and Silver to eat until Daddy eats first. And he explains that they are the lions of AEW and we prey on the weak. Goddamn. And he's eating his food and he asks, what's wrong with the two of you? And John Silver goes to eat, and he gets kicked out by Lee. And then Alex Reynolds commits the ultimate sin. He sneezes, <laughs> and Lee kicks him out, and he goes back to eating his steak. So <laughs> this guy is clearly now a Vince McMahon parody. And um, what what are the other Vincisms besides the sneezing? So we had the sneeze. I don't want to take credit for the steak thing, but if you listen to this Jeff Merrick interview, like there is a specific line that when Jeff went down to Stanford to tape these interviews for off the record, and I I believe he had lunch with Vince and he was asking him um, a question about Hulk Hogan at the time being on Larry King live and kind of knocking the company. And Vince McMahon told Jeff, he said, I'm a carnivore. When I sit down, I want to have the biggest juiciest steak and if i feel sick the next day so be it which is such a vince mcmahon line and it's also like the stories that we have heard all throughout the years from like writers and people around him is that 
dude, this dude loves his steak wraps with steak and ketchup. Steak and ketchup, okay. So I would imagine like this is going to be all like inside references from all the ex WWE guys and their Vinceisms that Brody Lee is going to be acting out. Which long term, I mean, we'll see if this works for this guy. I don't know if it's more so just entertaining those involved. Um, if this is going to land with fans that maybe are not going to get all these references, like honestly, I, I would say AEW fans maybe are more inclined to know about like the sneezing stuff, but that's not like the most common knowledge I would say to someone that is a fair weather fan of pro wrestling that are going to get these things. But maybe that's besides the point that the overall presentation is here is this overbearing tyrant in Brody Lee and they just happen to be referencing something that fans are either going to get or not get the double, uh, the double meaning to. If you didn't get it, I, I maybe you would have just thought this was like a, you know, hygiene thing. Yeah, it's like maybe he's uh doing a Howard Hughes gimmick, sneezing, like he's just a uh, you know a germaphobe. Well, at this point in time, I, everyone should be of, a germaphobe. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a, I would react the same way. I too. mean, honestly, Brody Lee to me in this climate was a babyface in this segment for sure. Dude, you sneezed, no elbow, like right onto the food. Like, get the fuck out of here. We eat one at a time, you know, to to reduce the 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 possibility of spread. Sure. Um, and social distancing. Get out of the room. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, I I I do feel like the jury's still kind of out on Brody Lee as the exalted one. I think Uno has done a great job setting it all up, but let's see if Lee can live up to those expectations. I do look forward to the in ring combinations though between. Brody Lee and the Smash Brothers. I think that could be a lot of fun. Well, Brody Lee, his first AEW opponent was a QT Marshall, who was billed from the Big Apple, which Cody corrected his own wife and said, he's from New Jersey, and then made fun of his hair loss. Hmm. Cody, uh, Cody, I think, had his own nickname for Brody Lee because he mentioned so many times that I knew him by a different name. He said this like three different times. Oh, okay. A lot of us did, I guess. Yeah. Well, this is Lee's uh, first match since November. Uh, it was all Brody Lee until QT Mar- Marshall hit an Insiguri and then ran into a sidewalk slam and a discus lariat as Brody Lee won two minutes, 58 seconds. Yeah. This time they do cut to the back and you had Austin Gunn holding up a sign complaining about somebody farting next to him. So yeah. that was sort of the thing. I, th- I mean... You know, this was a debut for Luke Harper. Personally, I, I would have liked to have seen more of a match like what J- Jake Hager had. I think this should have been a quick squash against somebody on the level of a QT Marshall. Or they could have saved Brody Lee's debut up for somebody uh, a bit more higher on the totem pole um, if they're going to go back and forth with it. But, you know, I mean, this was this was okay. It was fine. Yeah, to me, it wasn't... Um... Wasn't a big impact for his first match. I mean, it's not the most ideal setting, but I would say, yeah, Jake Hager's came across more uh, dominant, um, which is kind of the the theme you're going for here. So we were promised an update on Nick Jackson, and the update came courtesy of Vanguard One, who flew all the way to Rancho Cucamonga, uh, California, and got into Nick Jackson's garage, and he is around 61% healed (laughs) this is great i loved it i thought this was pretty clever Mm -hmm. um it it was also very funny because when they teed up nick jackson update they had the photo of nick underneath the garage bleeding from the mouth and cody calls out the selection choice for the photo i thought that was pretty funny god i would too imagine how insensitive who chose this photo he's bleeding from the mouth he's (laughs) underneath i mean imagine someone if they were trapped under a car or something Coming up at six, Jeez. the latest on the poor man who was locked under a car and needed the jaws of life to break free. Oh. Here's a photo of what's coming up at six o'clock. Mm-hmm. Kenny Omega, Sammy Guevara, Triple A, Mega Heavyweight Title, and man, I had my volume down so much for this whole thing, and I just turned it up. It's this is way better. Oh, okay, good. Have I have I been screaming at you? No, no, you sounded fine. Um, Kenny Omega, Sammy Guevara for the AAA Mega Heavyweight title. So Sammy comes down, and ringside, he's got hand-drawn pictures of Chris Jericho, 
Brandy, and Cody drawn uh, with the caption of the captain with um, a forehead that resembled uh, Joanna Yan Jacek's from a few weeks ago when she fought uh, Zhang Wiley. Right. Okay. Was it? Was it? Um. Yeah. Co- and, and Cody he, was trying to figure out which um, Star which, Trek captain this was because it didn't look like any of them, and he was like having fun with it. He ended up maybe deducing it that it was uh, what's his name, Chris Pine. Um, that reference escapes me. I I don't from from the it. from the remake from the okay yeah not not my not my cup of tea. So this okay. is the this was the captain from the latest movie. I guess so. Okay. I rely on you for modern day. Oh, I'm not a Trekkie at all. Well, compared to me, you are. Sammy attacked Kenny's uh, injured right hand, and they go to the floor, and Cody notes a bit of a playoff vibe here from Aubrey Edwards, who's just kind of letting them go here with the count. They go to a break as Sammy starts sticking his tongue all over the photo of Brandy, who is looking repulsed as they cut to her here. That is pretty gross. Sammy is then trying to flirt with Brandy, which leads to him getting slapped. Omega fights back, hits him with a vertical suplex on the floor. They go through a second commercial break. Omega really fires up here while selling the hand at the same time. The locker room was kind of getting old at this point. He intensifies, hits a V-trigger, then the Tiger Driver 98 getting a two count. And Sammy is then despondent on his knees and just gets drilled with another V trigger and the one winged angel by Kenny Omega, who retains the title. Um, I you know very good performance. Um, I personally i I found difficulty getting into a longer match within a setting like this, even if it was a Kenny Omega Sammy Guevara match. I felt like there were just so many. To me, this was very striking. In that, like when I think about about a Kenny Omega match, I think about the Tokyo Dome. You know, and to see it in sort of this empty arena setting, it was this kind of had me um, needing to adjust a little bit more. And so I never really quite got, got into it. I also just sense no interest in seeing either person win this pretty much non-existent championship in AEW. Um, but again, it's like, you know, I I, I feel bad for criticizing because they're they're working very hard to to provide fresh content right now. Yeah, I, I had some high expectations for this. I was looking forward to this when they announced it. And the match was – it was fine, but certainly not at the level I think that many people were anticipating here. And and could it have been? I mean, mm-hmm. when you're thinking of a big Kenny Omega match, I mean, it was – you know, so much of it, it's like the crowd takes a lot out of it. And that's going to be uh, repeated ad nauseum as we look at some of these matches. But we've seen like a wide degree of quality of – empty arena matches and i've been starting to think this week way um are we gonna have a new category at the end of the year best empty arena match i think we have to this year oh boy um okay sure i mean that'll be a tricky one what what's your front runner so far so far mine would probably be will osprey and b Priestley. Although B Priestley was also in a, in a tag with uh, with uh, Jamie Hayter last week, um, that was also very good. Probably Will Ospreay and B Priestley, I, I think. Has there been a better one? Uh, a lot of people have said really good things about that two hundred five live ten man, which I haven't seen yet. That I have not seen. Um, you know, obviously, I think there was a, uh, you know, Brian Gulak. Um, what, they were in a tag match, and they were also in something I forget, or Brian Cesaro maybe, but. I'm going to have to go back and dig through some of these, John. This will be a really tough choice. The empty arena playlist that someone will compile at the end of the year. There's, and, That's right. There's going to be a lot of contenders. Oh, yeah. We haven't had WrestleMania yet. Yeah, yeah. We have all those uh, to look forward to. I, will we have best Boneyard match? And does Boneyard, the Boneyard match count as a empty arena match? Oh, good question. Um, it depends how many bones there are, I guess. They are doing that with Gargano and Ciampa. The idea is Triple H is, in two weeks, going to message them a location. They are to show up at that location, and that's where their fight will take place. So they don't know where it will be. It, will be at. it could be a Chuck E. Cheese. Though I don't imagine Chuck E. Cheese would be open right now anywhere. Yeah. Final segment is Chris Jericho 
and the confrontation with Matt Hardy. And they did make it clear it was a confrontation. So Jericho comes out and he's got a lav mic on. And do you think that this was done just to not have, you know, it, we've seen like several instances. They did this on the GCW show. Uh, if you remember Joey Janela, when he did his promo, he had, there was a, a handheld mic, but they had a cup at the bottom. And I think it was just to limit the amount of people putting their hands on this thing. I think that was more, wasn't that just him kind of like making fun of it? Because I'm pretty sure everybody else grabbed the mic afterwards. I only saw that promo, so I can't compare them to the others. I thought it was actually a, a safety measure, even if uh, he was doing it as a joke. Um, but that's what that's that was my assumption here was that they decided to have hand hands free uh, microphones. I that, that that would certainly be the the only explanation I could come up with. You know, professional wrestling in ring segments don't typically use these types of microphones. Um, it's the only explanation I could come up with. This was also the only talking segment that they had in ring on this episode. So could be, I, I, yeah. I don't know. So it starts with Jericho and he's pretty much just doing the, this, this monologue when, uh, and mentioning Matt Hardy, who he's known for 25 years, debuted last week. Vanguard one flies into the building and he refers to Mr. Guard. I don't like you. I don't like what you stand for. I don't like your beliefs. You're arrogant. I don't care for your political views on social media. You're a piece of shit, Vanguard. And then asks Vanguard 1 to join the inner circle. And all the power will lie in your propellers. There will be bubbly going down your gas tank. The Instagram drone models will be following you. And then Vanguard 1 flies off as Jericho takes this as an affront that he is leaving him. I I thought this was like for all the comparisons about, you know, a wrestler that can have a match with a broomstick. This was literally having a promo with a broomstick, I guess, in a figurative fashion with with a with a drone. And I, I thought Jericho was like as equipped as anyone to try and do this. I thought it was really funny. Him cutting a promo some... in Vanguard one. Yeah. Yes. Then we had Matt Hardy enter the arena where he is just uh superimposed and just popping out throughout the what what would be the uh I don't. The I don't think technical he, term of this. I don't think he was superimposed. I think he actually was in every single spot, but they just cut the camera every single time he moved, uh, because you could see Jericho slightly shift in the foreground. I I once had to do a shoot where I ended up being the cameraman that had to make sure the camera stayed steady as the subjects went to different placements, and then they would cut them together so it looks like they're just popping all over the place. Actually, you, Actually, you had to. Be uh, the yeah, yeah. Don't, don't. Just stop it. Just stop it. No, you're not <laughs> in your rap video. I just remembered. I just something remembered. like this exactly in okay. the in the final verse. Yes. So obviously, this part was was taped. So Matt Hardy, <laughs> I remember <laughs> that like halfway through my story. I remembered another time, asshole. So Matt Hardy, he knew that Chris would come, and he says that I am magic. Matt says that AEW represents freedom, and this is Matt's Arcadia. He cannot let the inner circle ruin this paradise, and it must be protected at all cost. And Jericho says that I resurrect careers. I resurrected Jake Hager's. I brought Moxley here. I have made Sammy Guevara. I made Ortiz. I made Santana. And I can make you too if you join the inner circle. Matt responds that he is Damascus. He is over 3,000 years old. And they remark how much each has changed and reinvented themselves over the last 25 years. But at their core, they are the same person. Hardy says Jericho is still evil and a hole of the ass. Jericho says that you're still the same Matt Hardy, living in the shadow of people like your younger brother, in the shadow of bad booking, and now in the shadow of Le Champion. He asks, are you inner circle or elite? Which leads to Matt yelling, delete. While Jericho yells, elite, back and forth. Matt then starts singing. He's pointing out Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King in the arena that Jericho can would be able to see if he just believed. And it ends with Jericho smacking him. And Matt Hardy strikes him down. And Chris has his own magic. As he says, abracadabra, Matt Hardy gets his ass kicked. And we got the run-in of Sammy Guevara to attack Matt Hardy and that prompted Kenny Omega and Cody to run in from the commentary position with chairs. 
attacking Jericho and Guevara and Hardy trying to launch pyro at them as the show ended. I really like Matt Hardy's performance. I mean, it's I feel like it's been a while since we've had, you know, a proper um, broken Matt Hardy appear on our TVs. And it's I'm. I I welcome it. I mean, I it's it, I think he's as great of it at it as ever, and I think it kind of oddly works in such a weird, empty arena environment. I love the fact that he was talking about the everyone's essences being in this arena, and Abraham Lincoln's here, and Martin Luther King are here. I thought that worked really well. Um, otherwise, I think the the promo segment itself it's felt very organic. It felt like these two. I, I wonder if at times like they were just straight up improvising some of it, um, and as a result, I didn't think it was the smoothest thing. But, you know, by the end, it, it it was entertaining, I thought. I I was really entertained with the Jericho and Vanguard portion. I thought that this segment was really tough without an audience there. And it was just, to me, it was, it was very tough for these two to overcome that environment. Because uh, I would imagine, like, this is, would be so enhanced if you had this this audience, uh, which, I mean, that goes for everything. But I think that we have seen, like, one of the things about these empty arena shows is that, especially on WWE, like, those solo promos, a lot of them have come off very effective in that setting. We have not seen too much of this, where it's a prolonged segment of two people going back and forth, and I think it was really tough in in this environment for them, given how long they had to go back and forth with one another and... So much of it was just designed for crowd interaction or the big pop when Matt gets uh, to knock down Chris or when the elite run in with the chairs and you kind of had to do it in in this environment. So I I thought it was tough. I do wonder if like, you know, scripted promos and scripted delivery, I wonder if that stuff comes across better in a closed set without a crowd versus, you know, maybe something that, that is more organic coming across better with a live audience. This certainly felt like more like I I had no issue with like them talking over each other or like again it it felt more natural in in that sense um, so um, I, I I again I really thought like Jericho solo with Vanguard one I thought like that, there's not too many people who could pull that off and make that as entertaining as it turned out to be but you know this is kind of the situation you're in you you try things and you find out things that work and don't work. I don't know if doing 10 minutes of this was uh, in this setting, you know, the if you can really make these work, it's tough, really hard. Um, however, our final words, we never know when he might get to do the sign off again. We're out of time. <laughs> oh, Tony getting that in was uh, awesome. Great. That was great. So that was dynamite. Um, you know, it was um, I don't think, I mean, show quality wise, I think a lot of people are going to prefer last week's show. Um, but I do like a lot of the just changes that they made just to make this overall a more, um, uh, more, more safer environment, just more cautious of all the things that they should be aware of as they're running these shows. So I really do applaud them for making adjustments this week. I agree uh, with those sentiments. Um I, I would love to see more pre-produced elements. I mean, I know some of these segments were live to tape and maybe a combination uh, this week, but I, I, st- I also, I just, I feel like, you know, I think this AEW crew has done so much great pre-production work with Road 2 and Being the Elite and things like that, that now would really be a perfect time to showcase it rather than, you know, matches that I, I think appear less than, you know, usual and really sometimes just even highlight how weird they are. Um, at the same time, I mean, even to produce a road two requires people going to different places and, you know, get, getting into rooms and getting, getting into airports potentially. So they might be kind of, you know, um, stuck with that, with that as well. But I, I, I do feel like more pre-produced elements, more interviews, more storytelling elements, I think would, would be, would make the show perhaps feel a bit more normal, a bit less strung together. Are you surprised AEW hasn't leaned on any of their past matches at this point like that seems to be something like they're actively avoiding yeah a little bit i mean you know um not not exactly sure why you know maybe maybe they want to keep that for a different time because who knows if they'll be able to do do shows again after but i don't know i I am a little bit surprised but it's also not like they have the same library that wwe can pull from either so i I wanted just to recap this so a few weeks ago uh one of our listeners uh uh 
I think it's Joel Robinson. Um, he's been sending us in uh, notes for AEW Plus because, you know, we don't see the commercial breaks. And there was a time like they were doing so much. No picture and, in picture on this show either. That's right. There was no picture in picture because I imagine uh, it, w- it wasn't live for hmm. some of this. That's okay. my guess, um, at least for no picture in picture. But it's just interesting to see, like, as he started sending in these notes, like, this is this is what they're at this point on – um, what was on the picture in picture, or sorry, on the AEW Plus portion. So during Kip Sabian and Darby Allen, uh, this included Cody and Tony chatting about the ring drapes and who bought them. Uh, hmm. For Sammy Guevara and Kenny Omega, they played Sammy's theme during the break while he flirted with Brandy. Then they switched to the AEW music, and then Sammy made out with the Brandy poster while looking at the real Brandy, which uh, we did see on TV. That's pretty much it. In terms of what you got extra on AEW Plus, which um, you know I, I don't think is a big complaint, but nonetheless, ring drapes or ring drape discussion. Okay, hmm. yeah. So there we go. All right, let's head to the forum and see what everyone had to say about tonight's show. And the forum gave tonight's show a seven point eight five. So a very satisfied audience tonight. Our audience loves AEW. Let's start with uh, Raphael from North Liberty. Only highlights from me tonight was Cody on commentary. He was great. Kenny Omega versus Sammy Guevara was fun. Sammy kissing the Brandy picture was hilarious. Hardy and Jericho are magic together. Jake the Snake, all of it. And Brody Lee as Vince is genius. Using his time in WWE as an inspiration for the Dark Order's cult is something that I couldn't have expected but love. Here's hoping that Brody Lee yells at his underlings for not being able to do a Southern accent. Keep up the great work, guys, and stay safe. On that note, way, like we saw the Dark Order and how they tried to push them that one week with the main event beatdown of the elite and how much negativity that came out of that. Do you think that going more of a comedy route with the Dark Order is maybe the best idea? Hmm. Or has so much been put into this that going comedy is kind of a. Kind of unnecessary, especially when you've just brought in this this talent in Brody Lee to make this sort of the focus of, you know, being just let's get all our jokes in on Vince McMahon through this character. I think it depends on the type of comedy, and I think that it depends on how competitive you make the the crew in ring when it's time to get. I mean, Chris Jericho is comedy, but at the same time, you know, when you need the inner circle to be a threat, they are a threat. They attack and they, you know, they cause real injury to to the performers. You could very much achieve the same thing. I personally have a feeling that, you know, perhaps the Vince, the ele- the comedic elements here, I wonder if it's as deliberate as, you know, wanting to make it comedy versus just coming up, coming up with something that is entertaining and, you know, the audience will not shit on like previous Dark Order segments have, um, have might have been. Uh, I kind of get the sense that it's just, hey, like you have an idea for something entertaining. Well, yeah, let's try it. We go to Andrew from Cape Breton who says, I am feeling the lack of crap this week. Lack of crowd this week. AEW was a pretty good show, but the crowd certainly helps it. This week wasn't a bad show as it was used mostly to put over some of the main event talent, but there's nothing wrong with that. Now is the best time to have enhancement matches considering that there is no crowd. Every match felt like it was one to put talent over and it accomplished that. The highlight of the show was how they seemed to be turning Brody Lee into what Vince McMahon is supposedly like in real life and using him as a cult leader. I guess if he started calling all the Dark Order members pal, it might be a little too on the nose. Decent show overall, 6 out of 10. AEW does seem to be having an easier time working with their restrictions. I'm not a fan of the handshakes, though. But then again, they are rubbing up against each other wrestling. I mean, that's it on on top of this. Like, we look at, you know, the handshakes. It's like, yeah, probably not preferred, but, like, look what, what we are engaging in here at the same time. So, um. Next up is Noah from Vaughn. Hope you guys are doing well. I thought it was another good show for AEW under these tough circumstances. Love the Jake Roberts promo and the way they handled Brody Lee on this show with the video and match. Kenny and Sammy killed it, and Jericho arguing with a drone was hysterical. 7.5 out of 10. I thought it was kind of interesting they did not promote anything for next week, although Cody mentioned Lance Archer would have his debut match because they usually at least promote one or two matches. Do you think this means they are unsure if they will be able to run next week? Um, 
I'd be really surprised. They uh, again, they were taping stuff, so I'm expecting a show next week. But I guess that was notable that they didn't uh, plug anything for next week. That is a staple that they do. Yeah, yeah. I imagine things are constantly changing. We got Alex in Portland who says the main event promo was made much better by the lack of audience, the teleportation cuts for Hardy, the lack of pauses for the crowd, the wrestlers not having to hold microphones. It felt real, or at least as real as a Man Hardy promo can be. While Harper didn't impress me as much as he could have, I'm still very interested to see how the Dark Order will work with an AEW. Remember the brawl they had with the Elite a few months ago that went nowhere? That's got to be a destination again. My question, how long do you think Harper will or should be undefeated? I feel he'll win a few feuds before taking his first loss in a title match against John Moxley. Um, I think they'll run with Harper for a bit. Um... And I think it ultimately comes down to how big of a feature performer he's going to be. I mean, is this going to be feuding with like SCU? Is he going to be sort of at that level or do they see more for him? Um, you could you could build him up for something more sizable. Um, I don't see them beating him anytime soon, though. I predict he won't win until they come back to doing crowd matches and significant matches. Um, I'd, he's He's like your ultimate bad guy that you've been building up for months. As protective as they've been of somebody like Jake Haker, I think they'll be even more protective. I mean, I, I think they should be more protective of Luke Harper or Brody Lee. Kenny says, okay show tonight, but let's get to the point. The Brody Lee thing is pathetic. For weeks, the elite were telling us to wait and see what the Dark Order, but they somehow found a way to make a group no one liked even worse. The guy is decent in the ring, but his gear makes him look like some creator wrestler. I'm not saying he should be able, he should be in a tank top and jeans, but the singlet doesn't work for the gimmick at all with all that's going on in the world right now do we really need a vince hate sneezing lol gimmick this is worse than billionaire ted all that said sammy is the best seven out of ten i i was not a big fan of the gear i'll give him that what did you think subjective but Mm -hmm. yeah we go on to uh our next one here and we've got raymond Alex Reynolds sneezing and getting kicked out by Brody Lee. Vanguard 1, snooping on Nick Jackson, who's social distancing at his home gym. Sammy with his own makeshift crowd for this match. Brandy's reaction to Sammy making out with a cartoon picture. Okay, well, he's just saying the creator. He's just just listing things that that happened on this show. So, like, correct. All these things happened. Uh, I guess these were his favorite things on the show. Okay, we got a Dan who says, I didn't enjoy this week's episode much. I thought the first hour was dull as dishwasher with... It, as dishwater with is dishwater that that dull? I mean, dishwater is. I mean, foamy. Depends. Yeah, what you're using. Useful. I mean, um, so, I di- mean, the signs in dishwater, I think, is interesting. Dishwasher water is like it's like a whirlpool in there. Oh, it's, that's it's, that's like the high end of like water it's, potential. It's exciting as fuck. Yeah. So anyway, he thought the first hour was dull as dishwater with three uninteresting matches made even worse by the lack of atmosphere, though Darby's homemade promo was great. I like Jake Roberts' delivery, incredibly captivating, but the content of his words were a little shallow considering it basically amounts to an old man begging a star to give his guy a match. Omega Sammy overcame the lack of crowd to to deliver a very good match and the easy highlight of the show. I hate the last segment though. Jericho arguing with the drone was amusing enough, but everything with Matt Hardy was terrible. Like watching a middle-aged, lifelong drama student finally get to perform his self-written and self-produced play, and it's awful. If these are the sort of ideas he was given to Vince, then no wonder we never got to see them on TV. The difference is you've seen the Matt Hardy character work. It's not like this is just something that he's thrown against the wall and it hasn't connected. It, it has worked in the past. It has, yeah. In a different setting, though. Yeah, I, I I do agree. Like Matt Hardy in that live setting, um, I, I think it, it was it didn't fully connect with me, so I I wasn't as as big a fan of it. MJ, I love the free to delete series. Enjoyed last week's debut, but tonight's edition of the Broken Matt Hardy Experiment 2.0 was a big zero for me. Felt incredibly flat. Would have been better served as Jericho visiting the Hardy compound for a chat. Pretty much every non wrestling segment with Matt Hardy should be edited video. Uh, I guess the entrance was edited. Yeah, I guess he means like pre pre taped. Yeah. 
Uh, I like Jake's video. That was awesome. Lots of lot of tonight's episode felt dumb. The backstage viewing, the guardrail comments, Brody Lee video without the actual good tag team in Dark Order. Big miss for me tonight. So, you know, mi- the, mixed mixed reaction tonight. Yeah, I mean, they are certainly working with. Uh, I mean, you have to remember they had a big show plan, and this was probably scraped together at the last second. And um, if they choose to go on to produce shows, it, they're going to be of this quality. I'm so glad they did not feel, well, we've got to do blood and guts this week. There was mm-hmm. no need to do this. Yeah. I, agree. I like hold on to it. There's no rush to do that match now. Mm-hmm. That's the opposite of like, we must go ahead with WrestleMania because we just have to. It's, you know, let's, let's do it when it's ready. Let's maximize this. We, we were going to sell over 10,000 tickets for this match. Why would we just give it away on TV for, for one week mm-hmm. in front of nobody? Um, where, to me, it's, you know, you hold on to it. That's a feud. You just have to snap your fingers and we're right back to it where the inner circle is going to take on the elite and you can do it at a time when it works for everybody and you can maximize the the value of presenting that match because watching that match in this setting, I think that would have been awful. Just what a, what an awful way to get this this potentially like s- signature match off the, off the ground for your company. I think they should save it for a pay-per-view. You could, like... I think just the absence of this match, it's like you're going to make people want this even more because it's it's being, you know, postponed. If they were, who knows if they can do their pay-per-view in May, but I, I wouldn't be against that at all. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, well, thanks, everybody, for your feedback tonight. Uh, as we mentioned, we're going to be back on Thursday with the Cafe Hangout, 3 p.m. Eastern Time on Thursday. And while we're at it, uh, do you want to give everyone a, a quick note about next week's Super Cafe Hangout? Yeah, we've got uh, basically our pre-WrestleMania edition of the Cafe Hangout next Thursday, April 2nd. And that'll start at 2 p.m. And it'll be live for everybody, not just patrons, at youtube.com slash postwrestling. John and I will be taking questions from anybody uh, through our phone, uh, through Super Chat. We'll be taking questions for two whole hours about anything you guys want to discuss. And we'll also be uh, trying to raise funds, selling a t-shirt uh, for a couple charities to help uh, COVID-19 um, support. So uh, do join in. We look forward to hearing from all of you, um, regardless of uh, which week it is. So uh, that's tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be reviewing the the Benoit Dark Side of the Ring episode. And then we've got Rewind to SmackDown coming up Friday night for members of the cafe. And then we will also have a new edition of Thunderstruck coming out Sunday with WH Park. And then Sunday night, Wayne and I will be back with an edition of the Double Shot. So lots of great stuff to look forward to. Go to postwrestling.com and postwrestlingcafe.com. That's it. Goodbye.